<laughs> Amen. Oh, oh, I think the rain's kept a few people away, so you're going to have to be like, like super loud. No one's going to escape today. Amen. 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 There you go. All right. I'll just start eyeballing all of you. Oh, yeah, thanks, Connor. Otherwise, it would have slipped over. God is good. God is good. All the time. Amen. It's like, I don't know, man. The rain is like, I don't know. It's like the storm has reminded us of our storms in our life. And I feel like maybe we've forgotten about the victory we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Because it's like, God is good. And I get it all the time. Like, God is good. All the time. All the time. All the time. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's, we've been talking about this, like, analogy of, of flying an aeroplane for the last, like, five weeks. And there's one thing that scares me about flying. Only one. There's only one thing. And that is plummeting to the ground at, at excess speed and crashing. And I always think in the plane, like, would I prefer land or water? You know? Would I prefer to either freeze to death in the water if I survive the impact or just have it over and done with on the land? Yeah, that's a really morbid thought, hey? And then when we select our seats, I'm like, where is the most likely place I would survive? And then I usually just choose the back because my logic is like the front will nosedive, the pilot's dead, I'll survive at the back and I'll just save everyone else. You know what I mean? Is anyone else worried about the plane crashing when you're on a plane? Do you realise how high you are on a man-made machine with an engine that you know nothing about, with a pilot you know nothing about, right? And they're just meant to get you to the destination. It's insane, right? It's insane. And sometimes, I, you know, I worry, <laughs> I worry about the plane crashing. You know, you know, one thing that we don't worry about is the plane not changing direction. Or the plane, yeah, the plane not changing direction. We just assume it's going to get us to where they tell us it's going to go. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's sometimes in our life. We're just cruising in this plane and sometimes our plane crashes and it sucks. Or sometimes we feel like we're going in a certain direction and the plane just changes direction, right? And we're like, this is not where I thought I would be. Five years ago, this is not where I thought I would be. Five weeks ago, this is not where I thought I'd be. Five minutes ago, this is not where I thought I'd be. Um, if <laughs> the title of today's message. How to stop worrying about the plane crashing. And my, my hope is that through this series, right, you know, we are believing in an impossible God. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to wake up to understanding that we walk with the God of the impossible. Like we walk with Yahweh. Like this is not like something that, you know, like you grew up in Sunday school, or you grew up in church, and then you, you come into church. It's like God is good. But like we're trying to wake up to understanding that we walk with Yahweh, like the God of the universe. Amen. And, and today I want to talk about being faithful in that God. Like sometimes I wonder... If, if, like, whoa, I was going to be super bold today. Is that okay? Compared to every other week. But you are here. <laughs> God's got a message for you, I'm telling you. God has got a message for you. God has got a message for you, right? And, and I feel like sometimes, like, can, can God actually be trusted? Yes! Amen! One person in the whole congregation. And that's not to condemn anyone, but that actually reflects how we live. You know, can God actually be trusted. And it's like, can he? Yes, someone is worshiping me in the back. Amen. Amen. This is so much more fun with your participation. We are a family. This is a gathering. I'm not here for your performance, right? And so feel free to say whatever you want to say, unless it's heresy and I'll kick you out. Um, but I just feel like God is trying to, trying to speak to someone, all of us probably, you know, and say, you could actually, actually, actually trust me. Amen. Like God is saying, you can actually trust me. Right? We're in a sermon series called Strapped In. Strapped In. And we're saying, you know, when you get in a plane, you don't go talk to the pilot. You don't go see where you're going. You don't try and look out the front window. You just strap in and trust. And this is how God wants us to live our life with him. We're talking about the faith to move mountains. Like week one, we talked about wrestling the tension between God holding all things together and yet we are invited to pray impossible prayers, right? We are invited to pray for impossible prayers, right? We, we said that we, we pray these impossible prayers because we are invited by our Lord Almighty and every prayer of faith that you pray ends up at the throne of God. 
and if you feel like your prayer is not answered, it ends up at the throne of God. That is a miracle in itself, right? And we said that miracles are for the demonstration of Jesus' power and for the proclamation of Jesus' name for revival all over the world. That is what miracles are for. That is what miracles are for. The second week we said we walk with Yahweh. We, we said our prayer should start with possibility because we pray to God that, that achieves the impossible. We start with possibility, but we end with your will, not my will. Right? We start with possibility, but we yield to the will of God. We yield to the, the will of God. Right? And we say glorify your name. Glorify your name. And we, we talked about how you know, praying to, to God and saying your will, not my will, is actually opting into his plan, and it's not a cop-out. It's actually not a cop-out. Right? It's actually opting into his plan. And last week we, said, we talked about having faith in the, in the waiting. In the waiting. Um, if, you ever want to see, if you ever want to get four weeks of sermons in, just come to the fourth week, and you're good. Like, you don't have to hear me. You know, it's like a book on speed. You know? um, God achieves his will in a broken world. We said God supersedes our broken world. And we said that our present reality doesn't always represent supernatural activity, right? Like you might be praying and you might be like, what is going on, Lord? I don't see anything. But God is actually working. Do you trust that God is actually working? Amen? Or do we actually have to have something to see and touch and have our flesh like validated to say, okay, God, now you're working the way I see you working? Or do we have faith that God is always working? Here's our question today. Do you have faith? Oh, this is one of those questions you've had a million times and you've answered a million times, but you may not have necessarily believed. Do you have faith that the God of the impossible is faithful? Do you have faith that the God of the impossible is faithful? And here's, here's, a good, here's a good question to, to find out where you are with this. Are you okay if your plane crashes? Are you okay if your plane crashes? If your destination changes? If the pilot turns the plane around and takes you back to exactly where you were five years ago? Are you okay with it? Are you okay with it? This, this, oh. Sometimes I'm like, no, I'm not okay with it, Lord. I'm actually not okay. Sometimes I'm like, no, don't crash my plane. I'm happy with my plane. I'm happy where it is, and I'm happy where I'm going, you know? And then he just goes, and crashes it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then I forget he packed me a life jacket. Amen. He packed me a life <laughs> Good on you. I just want to say, like, there's a, oh, there's a message here, right? We're going to talk about, like, putting God first today. And good on you for getting up this morning and coming to a gathering to worship our Lord and Saviour, no matter what happened. Because I felt like we were in prayer meeting this morning, and I really felt like the enemy getting in people's heads in our region and saying, don't go to church. Amen. So well done for getting up, right, and fighting whatever you had to fight this morning, namely children, amen, who are the parents in the house, right? Because I tell you what, every time you get up on Sunday morning, there are spiritual forces trying to stop you from getting to a gathering and trying to lie to you, right, so you do not realise the truth and the victory that you are walking in, amen. Because every time you come to a gathering, right, the Holy Spirit will convict you and the enemy can't touch it because look how many Holy Spirits are in one room, amen, right, amen, gathering and worshipping our Lord and Saviour and you can't tell me you don't walk out saying, gosh, that was some truth today, amen, amen. And so while the victory has been won, right, we have a spiritual enemy trying to stop you from getting to a gathering of believers to reinforce the truth in you of the victory that you walk out of. Amen. So you can be a more effective instrument for him. So I just want to say, good on you, right, for getting here this morning. Because I felt there were some spiritual forces stopping people from getting to churches this morning. Not just here, but in every church, right? Amen. Because the enemy wants to slow us down, but the enemy can't slow us down. Because we have the victory. Amen. Amen. And so when you get up Sunday morning and something happens... You just say, get behind me, Satan, because I'm going to go gather with my brothers and sister where I worship the God of the Apostle, and I worship Yahweh. Amen. And you're not going to stop me getting there. Amen. 
a little bit of rain is not going to stop me from getting there. Luke 22, 42, and this has been our anchor prayer for the series, is Jesus sweating drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. He is praying the impossible prayer. The one thing that Jesus had to do was go to the cross. He had to go. And he's saying to his father, can you please, that thing I came to do, can you take it away from me? Can I do it without doing the thing that I came here to do? So we pray. He knows that God can't say yes. And yet he prays anyway. Give me this faith. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He then says, fine, have your way. Have your way, Lord. I'll, I'll drink the cup of suffering and I'll go to the cross. And we're all going to have seasons on our knees. Amen. We're all going to have seasons on our knees. And sometimes we have the God of the impossible and sometimes he will answer you when you're on your knees and sometimes he won't. Because he didn't answer Jesus with the first part of this prayer. He didn't answer Jesus with the first part of this prayer. And do you know what that means? If you're on your knees and you're begging the Father for mercy and for grace and for love and he doesn't answer, do you know what that means? That means he's God. And he chose not to. Because he is Yahweh. And we are not. He is God. Right. And I want, I want, to, I want to speak about having faith even if your direction changes, even if your plane crashes, even if something goes on, I, I want to talk about having, having that faith that Jesus had. Right? And there's, there's an invitation here on the table. This, you know, when, whenever, whenever we hear the word of God, there's an invitation to take it. There's an invitation to apply it to your heart. There's an invitation there to, for, for change and for conviction. Amen. Right? Like we have to respond. That's the point. You've been given free will. You know, when it says that you've been made in God's image, like that it means that you've been given free will that God has. He's given that to you, that free will to actually accept the truth and apply it to our heart. And so it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for two minutes, for five years, for 50 years. There is an invitation on the table here for, for you to take this morning. Right? There's an invitation. There's an invitation to put the kingdom first. Amen. There's an invitation to build your life on his foundation. And there's an invitation to pick up your spiritual weapons today. There's an invitation. That's the three things we're going to talk about. Right? You're like, oh, I've heard that in church before. It's so boring. Okay. Question. Is God faithful? Is God faithful? And you might say, yes, of course. Like you've said to me like five times today, right? Yes, of course he is. Of course he's faithful. Until he doesn't heal someone. Of course he's faithful. Until we run out of money. Of course he's faithful. So I just can't forgive someone. Of course he's faithful. And, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to condemn anyone, but I want to try and equip you because, you know, we're, <laughs> we're real. We're real people. Did you know that? We're actually not like heavenly angels on earth. We're broken people in a broken world, right? And the difference between us and the people out there is we've just admitted it. <laughs> Amen. So let's just be real in this place today. Amen. Let's just be real in this place today. Right? Um, Real faith. Real faith. Here we go. Letting our faith determine... This is really important. Letting our faith determine how we feel about our circumstances and not letting our circumstances determine how we feel about our faith. Woo! God is good! Amen! We have become a people of feeling. Amen! And not knowledge of the truth. Amen. We have a truth in Jesus Christ. We have a truth in Jesus Christ. And too often have we let our circumstances and our feelings determine who our God is. We've let our feelings determine our faith and what we stand on. You know, we, 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 we turn around and say, well, you know, if, if God is faithful, he would have done this. He would have done that. He would have done this. What, you know, he would have done that. You know? But our faith runs so much deeper than how we feel. You know, if he just said, don't be formed by your feelings, there's a reason for that. 
You know, there, there's, there's worship services where I, when I, where I really feel God, like really feel the presence of God. And I'm worshiping, I really feel the presence of God. And there's worship services where I just don't. And he is there. And he is there. He is there. Amen. Amen. He is, he is working through me. If I've, I've, if I've given him everything, if I've sacrificed my life to him, and I say, Lord, your will, but not, not my will. My faith runs deeper than how I feel in the morning. Amen. My, my faith runs on his promises. That I, in his words. Amen. Like last week we said, you know, like Paul got an angel to come speak to him, and, and we're like, oh, I wish an angel would come speak to me. But we've got the word of God. Like open the Bible, he'll speak to you. Amen. He will speak to you. Trust that no matter if the plane crashes or the plane changes directions, you know who's in charge. You know who sits on the throne. Who sits on the throne of your heart. Who sits on the throne of your life. Who sits on the throne of the universe. All right, All right let's go to the Bible. All right. all right, I'll give you some Bible. We all know it. Matthew six twenty five. Therefore I tell you, <laughs> when Ephraim says, therefore I tell you, or truly, truly I tell you, that's like today's speak for, oi, listen up. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's him saying, oi, pay attention. Do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. You know, we know this one. It goes on to say, if I look after the birds when I feed you, look at the lilies, look how amazing the lilies are. You know, how much more am I going to, you know, look after you? And then he says, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Did you know your heavenly Father knows what you need? Oh, it's good. Sometimes we don't like what we need. My kids hate broccoli. I still try and make them eat it. I say try because we don't negotiate with terrorists. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Woo! Ah! You cannot have one without the other. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be added to you. Some of us love to say, all will be added to us. We read it like this. Father knows that you need them all, and all these things will be added to you. But there's something we need to do. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of... Don't, don't you think it's interesting? I think it's interesting to me that it doesn't say, seek first God. Doesn't that seem interesting to you? Why does it just say, put God first? Right? You can speak to half, half a million people, right? And, 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 and you will get so many people that say they believe in God. You'll get so many. People say, I believe in God. So what? So what? The hippie in the bushes believes in God. Right? But do you believe in the authority of Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the authority that you walk under and you have been given in Jesus Christ? Because that is where our faith is. Anyone can believe in God. right? And so what does it mean when he says, seek first the kingdom of God? If you have been saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. Amen. Right? So you have this holiness in you, and, and, and so you're already saved, right? We've talked about this before. You're already saved. You're already saved from death. You're already seated in eternity, and you're walking around with this light in you, and yet you're in a broken world and you're a broken person, right? And so you're already saved and still not yet there in heaven, right? And so how do we advance the kingdom of God? We advance the kingdom of God, right, by adding more believers. Amen? Amen? That's how, we, that's how we advance the kingdom of God and we push back the force of darkness. When someone comes in from the world that is shameful and guilty and they get, and they get given an opportunity and, and the Holy Spirit convicts their heart to turn the other way, amen, and they, and they, oh, God is good, and they believe it in their heart and they confess it with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, amen, 
there is another one added to the number. And we have advanced the kingdom of God here on earth. Amen. 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 This is a light right now for the, for the community of Vass. And everything that we do should be to advance the kingdom of God. Amen. You exist for two reasons. To know God and to advance his kingdom. That is why you are still on earth, because he has a job for you to do for him. Amen. And so what is seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and all will be added to you. God wants his children home and he's using you as an agent to do it. Amen. You are to go into the world and preach the gospel and they will know you by your fruits. Amen. Amen. And so everything that we do, everything that we do should be motivated by advancing his kingdom. Amen. Which he wants to do through you. That what a privilege. What a privilege. What a privilege. Like, man, I've been to some dodgy job interviews. You know what I mean? And, 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 and BC era, like I have forged some dodgy resumes. Lord, I repent from it right now. Right? My mate who was my reference check did not actually work there. <laughs> right? And I've got myself into some dodgy jobs before Christ, right? I, I repent from that. Your job application to the Lord Almighty, to Yahweh, was broken. Guilty. Shame. And he's taken your job application and he has given you the Holy Spirit and says, you are hired to do my work. What a privilege. What a privilege to be used by Yahweh to advance his kingdom. What a privilege. Seek first the kingdom. What if, it, what if in your poverty, God is building a testimony? What if in your sickness, God is going to do a miracle where everyone that sees that miracle is going to get saved? What if in your, your riches you have been given resources to build the kingdom? In your loneliness, you've been given the opportunity to find Jesus in an intimate way. We are so caught up in the will of the flesh that we lose sight of the will of God. We're not promised a cushy life. You might get it. Praise God. Be, let God get the glory for that. Right? Let God get the glory for that. But you're promised peace in a storm. That is amazing. You are promised peace and joy in a storm. I mean, I, I can't even fathom that. I can't, I can't even. Like, that is just amazing. His mercies are fresh every morning. Like we read this, the joy is, is meant to be our state of being. No matter what comes our way, that is just... What do we need to know? The advancement of the kingdom of God is found in his will and not our wishes. It's found in his will and not our wishes. This is a hard-hitting word today. Hey, I, feel, I feel everyone sitting there going, leave me alone. Get away from me. God wants this to be a way of life, right? God wants us putting him first, putting his kingdom first, to be a way of life, like breathing, right? Like breathing. Like, what does that mean? Like, just breathe for a second. Now just realize that God put that oxygen in your lungs. God put that oxygen there. God gave you the, ab the ability to take every breath you took. When was the last time you thanked him for it? When was the last time you thanked him for getting up this morning in our chaos and our rubbish, you know? If you're not dead, God's not done with you. You know you're going to glory, right? <laughs> like, it's going to be so much better. It's going to be so much better, right? Thank you, Lord, that you're continuing to use me Thank you, Lord, that you, have, you just keep forgiving. Thank you, Lord, for just having, 
having like mercy on me, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I have a body that regenerates itself, that heals. You know, you have no idea how much healing is done in your body. You have no idea. You have no idea how much, how many, how many sicknesses you've been avoided because of God's healing power on your body that you don't even see. You don't even see like the precancer that was happening, and God just said, "No, nah, I'm not you. I'm not done with you. Healed." You have no idea the power that God that God has over your life and His sustaining work on you. You know that we could just pour out our thank you for. Remember, it's, it's not our job, right? It's not our job, right, um, to, to worry about our needs. It's our job to seek. It's our job to seek first. His job is to add. We seek, he adds. How amazing is that? We seek, he adds. We seek, he adds. Psalm 20, 127, 1. Woo! <laughs> this is a good, good Bible. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it will labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Oh, how good is that? That is some good Bible. That is a good psalm. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for that psalm. Morning. What do we do? What do we do in the morning? We get up, right? And we ask him to build his house. We ask him to build his house. You're getting up and you're failing in something in your area and you haven't even asked him to bless it. You haven't even stopped and asked him to help you build it. You know, you know, there's 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 an area in your life and, and you're not even you're not even you're not even giving it over. Lord, your house. I'll turn up, but can you do the building? I'll turn up. But can you do the blessing? I'll turn up. But can you do the adding? You know, at night, don't, don't, when you sleep, when you go to bed and you're, and you're laying in bed, don't go through the check boxes in your brain about the things that you stuffed up or the things that you overshared or the things that you didn't share or the things that you should have done, right? No, no, just put God first. Seek first his kingdom and ask him to watch over it. Amen. Lord, I put you first. In my sleep, you can do abundantly more than what I can do in my work. You know, so I'm not going to sit here and reminisce about every little decision that I did. I'm actually just going to put you first, right? Close your eyes. Go to sleep. What does God want you to do right now? When he, when he puts your, you in bed and he gives you the gift of being tired, what does God want you to do? He wants you to sleep. And he wants you to let him take care of it. Amen? I, I often like, I had times where I could not, I, I had times where I could not sleep. I'm a massive like type A personality who loves to, to rumorate and, and, and go through checklists and go through things, right? And, and there was a time where um, I just did not sleep for months, right? Yep, your pastor's messed up too, get over it, right? And, and, I, and, and, and I was just laying there, right? And, and I was just like far out and I'm ruminating and ruminating and ruminating. I just could not sleep. And I was like, well, if I can't sleep, I'll just start praying, you know? And so if some of you feel a bit more prayed for, you're welcome, right? And so I wasn't, I was just using the time. I was using the time so I could just pray for everyone and, and pray for people in our church, rah, rah. And, and, and God just said, I want you to sleep. And that is like an amazing, like you might think, oh, that's nothing, you know. But it's like, well, what's my job right now? My job is to sleep. My God wants me to sleep and wants me to rest so I'm an effective instrument in the morning. And I'm worrying about his job. Oh, Lord, what about this? This happened and what about this? Per-? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I know, but I said this. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, but this, yeah, I got it. And I'm trying to control, and his job is to control. Amen. Amen. Put God first in your rising and your setting. Lord, wake up in the morning and say, Father, will you provide and guide today? Will you anoint and appoint? Will you correct and rebuke? And then walk it out in faith. Amen. Walk it out knowing that you take the next step with Yahweh. Like, come on. The problem is, is that it's not easy. <laughs> Dang it. And God is really good at revealing our flesh. It sucks. It's like, Lord, leave me alone. <laughs> no, I'm trying to get a better relationship with you. No. <laughs> you know, you're all looking at me like, no, I want a relationship with God. Just don't bring up that thing about my past that I really hate. You know? God wants you to trust him. I don't care if you've heard this a million times before. You're going to hear it a million times today. And you're sitting in the service because God wanted you here because you heard it a million times before, but you weren't listening. And He's hoping that today you will listen. 
Exodus 25. You shall not bow down. To, he's talking about idols. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Isn't that amazing? Like This has been one of those big theological arguments. All God is saying is he doesn't want anything else to be an idol except for him. It actually matters. He wants to be your number one in everything in your life. If there is an area that you're not putting God first, if you're not trusting him, God is exposing it because he wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you. Conviction is meant to bring you closer to God. Amen. It's a good thing. Discipline is a good thing. Authority is a good thing. And society and the world and our spiritual enemy, Satan, has taken these good things and turned it on its head, you know, and we've become a, a culture that hates discipline. I'll do what I want. Leave me alone. Well, what's right? What I think is right is right, you know? And authority, get that away. I'm my own authority, you know? But it's such a good thing because we've forgotten that God is a good God. And with his authority and with his discipline and with his prodding and his poking, he puts us on the narrow path and... and Here's a, here's a tip. The narrow path leads to life. Amen. We have forgotten that the truth leads to life. Amen. And we've, we've tried to create a cushy gospel. We've tried to create a comfortable Jesus. We've tried to create this thing that, that we don't offend anyone with because we've forgotten that the truth leads to life. Amen. The truth leads to life. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting really intense, but uh, this is so serious because I just feel like we have just forgotten somewhere along the line. Somewhere along the line, we have forgotten that his truth leads to life and we should lean into his truth, not away from it. And we're so scared of offending people. When did we ever get scared of offending people in the church? Because we feel like truth doesn't lead to life and all we care about is filling chairs. Amen. But his truth leads to life. And so I will stand here and I will preach the gospel with whole truth until the day I die because I want to see you set free. And I want to see you live a life that is truly life. I want to see you walk into storms for Jesus with joy, with joy flowing from your hearts. I want to see you broken and turned to the Lord. I want to see victory in your life. And so I don't care if we go down to one person in a chair because everyone's offended. We will preach truth. Amen. Because we truly believe that truth leads to life. Jesus came to give you life, to give you victory, to give you a seat in heaven forever. Amen. And that is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. Oh, God is good. You can fake it in here, but you can't fake it to God. You can fake it in here, but you can't fake it to God. God wants your heart. He wants your heart. Are we good? This is intermission and you may leave if you like. We all have deficiencies. Amen? Because we're broken. We all have deficiencies. We live in a broken world. Right? Broken people in a broken world. Right? Did you ever think... Oh, this hit me, right? Yahweh, the God of the impossible that can move mountains, that can do anything. Do you ever think that deficiency that you have, God can take it away in an instant? He, do you believe he has the power to take your deficiency away in an instant? So why doesn't he? That's the question we should be asking. Why are you not taking away this deficiency, right? Because in that deficiency, God is trying to lead you to him. In that deficiency, God is trying to lead you to him. God is sufficient for every situation and every season. Every season, every situation, God is sufficient. God is sufficient, right? And, and we, we, we think, God, why aren't you taking it away? Because God is trying to use that deficiency to put himself in the gap. Let me explain. Let me explain. Want to know? <laughs> Come on. All right. Who wants freedom in the house today? All right. I want freedom in the house today, amen. Right? If anyone had a right, if anyone in the whole Bible had a right for his issues to be taken away, and I really feel sorry for him every time I read this, it is Paul. Amen? But you know the Apostle Paul who wrote a third of the Bible? Like, he is travelling around, like, he's going to prison, he's getting beaten, like, an angel comes and tells him you're going to be beheaded in Rome, you know? And he's going to, into, into Jews and getting abused, and he's taking the gospel from the world to the world to the world. 
island to island to country to country to country, if anyone had the right to have his deficiency taken away, it should have been Paul. And I say it like that because I'm still a little bit upset with God about it. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. So to keep me from becoming conceited. Do not conceited me. It means proud. It's a word for proud. To stop me from being proud, right? Uh, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, that's like what God is saying through him. So to stop me from being proud from how you're using me, right? A thorn was given to me in the flesh. I love how he talks about, this is past tense, so it's like he's already like come to terms with why. It's great. A messenger of Satan to harass me. That sounds fantastic. What a good time. To keep me from becoming conceited. Again, when Paul repeats something, it's really important. Three times, just like the Garden of Gethsemane, just like Jesus in the Garden. Three times, I pleaded. I pleaded. That means begged. I begged. I begged the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient to you, for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that one of those lines? Like, oh, come on, God. That's great. Take it away. <laughs> that's great. You know, that's great. It's like when I say to my kids, and something happens, and it's like, no, 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 I'm teaching you something. Alexis is like, oh. You know, and sometimes in my deficiency, I pray to God, and he's like, no, I'm trying to teach you something. I'm like, oh. I'm pretty sure this is how Paul felt, right? I don't know. It doesn't say it. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that, here we go, the power of Christ may rest upon me. God, take that thing away from me, right? But God is saying that thing that I've given you is keeping your, you dependent on me. That thorn in your flesh is keeping you dependent on me. And that is far more important than your comfort right now. That thorn is keeping you dependent. My, my grace is sufficient for you. And some of us need to hear that his grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient. Here's the question. Here's the question. Don't stone me. Are you asking God to take away your thorn so you don't need to rely on him anymore? Are you asking God to take away your thorn so you don't have to rely on him anymore? In those times where you are on your knees praying to God in desperation and he answered your prayer, the next night were you on your knees praying to him in desperation? Because I reckon that most of us are not. And I say that because most of the time I'm not. But God wants us on our knees in desperation for him all the time. He wants us to seek him first all the time. All the time. He sees the thorn he's given you and he sees the relationship he has with you in this desperate state. And he's like, I want, I want this relationship with you all the time. All the time. Like you're having to pray for me all the time. You're having, to, you're having to put me in the gap every single day, you know? And we have this relationship. I'm in the gap every single day. And if I take that thing away from you, you're going to go wayward. And you're going to go back to the broad path. But I want you are on the narrow path right now because you are relying on me to fill. You are relying on me. And as we grow, you know, it's like, it's like that person I spoke about last week, you know, who had that blood clotting issue and she prayed the whole time, right? God had the, had the power to take away the blood clotting issue and he was. She just wasn't realising it, right? She just wasn't realising it and, and, and it was. And then she's like, okay, your will, not my will. And, and, and God knew, okay, now, now the healing comes because I get to keep my relationship with you. Amen. Amen. And I, I have an update on that story, right? Because was, last week I said, maybe, maybe it's an aspirin problem and this week I can tell you that without a shadow of a doubt, 100%, it was just an aspirin problem. Amen. And now they are able to have a baby. Someone give God some glory. Amen. Because that, was, that is a miracle. 18 months, three miscarriages, and God did a work, and now they're having a baby. Come on. God is good. Amen. But God wants us to be 
on our knees with him, saying, build your kingdom through me. Build your kingdom through me. Amen. 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 If God filled your bank account, you'd probably walk away from him. That's why it's not filled right now. Right? If you're completely healed, you might walk away from him. That's why you're not completely healed right now. He looks at your hearts. and He's asking you, get your heart right before me. Get your heart right. Am I everything that you need? God is everything that you need and so much more. He is Nims and Meod. Be still and know that I am God. I am every, that's, what, that's what Nims and Meod means. It's in the psalm. And when, the, when the armies were coming, you know, they had 400,000 soldiers come and they were going to rape the village and they were going to kill all the sons and they were going to torture them in front of their families. It was going to be absolutely horrible. And the word of God came on, on um, Kior and said, Nims and Meod. I am the Lord your God and I'm everything that you need and so much more. And it was at the point when, when he turned around to the, the Lord God and said, Lord, your way, not my way. And an angel came from heaven, one angel, and decimated the entire enemy. God has the power to do that. And he wants us to seek first his kingdom and be fully dependent on him just like the mustard seed is. Fully dependent on him. So the question is, what are you putting in the gap? What are you putting in the gap? Lonely? Filling it up with random people in the gap. Money? Putting stress in the gap. Putting frustration in the gap. Putting anxiety. And that's all real thing, right? Do you struggle with self-worth? Are you putting porn in the gap? What are you putting in the gap that God is trying to fill? Because the world will always offer you a temporary solution. That always leads to destruction. Drinking, drinking five, six beers a night might, might, might feel really good until a year later and you've got an addiction. Right? The time you watch that porn may feel really good at the time. Whenever you... <laughs> it feels really dirty afterwards. Right? That drug feels great on the night until you can't not get more of it. What are you what are you putting in the gap? God, put God in the gap. You are a broken person. What I want to tell you is God supersedes a broken person. Amen. God supersedes a broken person. Amen. And he fills you. He fills you with the with the light. Amen. Amen. I'm gonna show you. Ugh, let's do it. Someone prayed that I wouldn't hurt myself in the demonstration. I was going to say I'm not sure why. Sorry, Connor. It's covered by insurance. I think. All right. We're going to set up a little demonstration. All right. I've got some things. Whoa. Oh, I'm not sure what's in this bag. I, don't, I know now. All right. Let's see. Okay. I'm not sure why you're all worried. Okay, this is our life. And we love to fill our life up with things, don't we? You know, whatever it is. It's money or jobs or... Oh, that's nice. Look, love hearts. Good. Money, jobs. Be thankful. That's a nice prayer. Let's fill that up. All right. Okay. Hey, open this thing, babe. Hang on, I've got it. No, I don't got it. Do I? No. I've been stitched up. There we go. I'll be very careful. Oh, oh, that's smart. Yeah, yeah, come on. All right, God's good. Let's stick that in there. Ooh, chill. All right, stick that in there. Life, work. My relationship, my job, Bible study, stick that in there. What else? What else do we do in life? What else do we do? What, sport, sport, we'll put that in there. Beers on a Friday night. I don't know why it's Friday night we have beers, right? Actually, we're Australian. Have beers whenever you want, right? Footies on, let's have a beer, you know? Tough day at the office, let's have a beer. You're pregnant, let's have a beer. I'll go home safely, let's have a beer. 
We use the beers for anything, don't we, in Australia? How do you think the enemy's not all over it? Come on. All right. What? Oh, now you're worried about the foundation. Oh, so now you see a storm coming and you see something heavy in your life and now you're worried about the foundation. And now we're going to start praying in desperation. But that doesn't make sense because I'm pretty sure the Word of God says, seek first the kingdom of God. But now we see a storm and we're seeking last the kingdom of God. And what we're really asking God to do is this foundation that I've built, Lord, can you just make it stronger? The job that I love, can you just make sure it keeps providing, Lord? This relationship that I got into without you and I haven't even involved you now, my bank account, which I don't even tithe from, can you make sure my mortgage is okay? Lord, please, because I see the storm. I see the storm coming, Lord. And can you fix my foundation? You know? And God says, sure, I can fix it. But first it needs to break. First it needs to break. Because you've actually built, you didn't even realise that when I put the MDF here that I was doing that, that I, was, uh, I wasn't even, you know, that was just something we do. I need a job, foundation. I need a wife, foundation. I need a house, foundation. But you, you haven't even involved God. And then what ends up happening is we pray in desperation at the end and it doesn't work and we just say, Lord, where are you? And sometimes we just land in this brokenness and this mess and we stay here and we say, Lord, where are you? Lord, where were you? Where were you? And God is saying, I was there the whole time. You just didn't reach out. You did not build your house on the firm foundation. And so I had to break it. I had to break it and I had to make a mess so that you knew in your mess that I am the Lord your God. And what does God do? God sees your mess. He sees everything that you've done in your life, right, as you keep praying and you keep being desperate, right, and he puts it all back in, right? Yep, even the big rock. In this storm that you've tried to ignore your whole life, but it happened to you, and it's part of your story, and God is saying, Don't ignore it because I'm about to pull you out of it, and I want the glory for it, and that's going to become a testimony. And He puts you back together, doesn't He? And He says, Right, now it's time to rebuild my house. Now it's time to rebuild my house on the firm foundation of me. And you have an opportunity now, right, to rebuild on the firm foundation. And he takes your crap and he takes your mess and he turns it into a miracle and he says, build it on my firm foundation. And that firm foundation will not break. Amen. Amen. Josh, will take care of that, I'm sure. Thanks, Josh. Let's go to a psalm quickly. Have we got time? Can we go quickly to a psalm? Because I just want to finish this off with like a kapow. Can I do that? Kapow. All right. Historic psalm. This is looking back, right? This is looking at the Israelites in the wilderness, right? They've come out of Egypt. They got provided manna for a day. This is really important. They get provided the manna for the day, right? And it was only for that day. And you know what they tried to do? They tried to store it. And maggots attacked it. And because maggots attacked it, I reckon it was steak. But it wasn't. And it documents their unbelief. And we're going to drive this bus home. Are you ready? We're going to drive it home through whatever wall is standing between you and God right now. And you giving up everything and building, a, building your house on the firm foundation. This bus is coming for your wall. Okay? Are you ready? Psalm 78.9. The Ephraim, the Ephraim, that. 
the Israelites, right? It was the northern part of Israel, okay? Armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. Woo, turned back, armed by God, turned back, right? Armed by God and turned back. Here's a tip. If you call yourself a Christian, you are not living in a playground. You are living in a battleground. Amen. Welcome to the battle. They turned back. Woo, it is hard to be faithful in a battle. I get it. It is hard to be faithful in a battle. But God makes spiritual resources available to his people. Amen. Amen. You've just rebuilt your life on the firm foundation that is God. Do not pick up the same weapons that you picked up before when the firm foundation failed. Amen. It is time to pick up different weapons. Because you have been armed by God. He gives you the sword of the Spirit. Are you going to use it? He has given you the breastplate of righteousness. Are you going to use it? He has given you the helmet of salvation. Are you going to use it? He has given you the shoes of peace. Are you going to walk in it? There is too many of us going into battle with the wrong weapons. Amen. Amen. When I was in... um. When I, when, I was, when I went to soccer a couple of years ago, right, and it was raining and it was pouring and the old man was snoring. <laughs> the old man was me. Um, and I just got completely, I went in my sneakers and my jeans and my shirt and I got completely soaked and my feet were completely wet. And our friend rocks up in this thing called a rain jacket. Don't know if anyone else knows what that is. And gum boots and they were completely dry. And they were like, you people are just not prepared. And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, I know that sounds silly to you lot, but to me, I didn't, you know, winter sport, it's raining, whatever, right? I was not prepared. I went into the rain without my rain jacket, and some of you are going into battles without the spiritual resources that God has given you. Amen. You know, and this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. Why are they so far away? Right? This is what it looks like. Go away. Right? This is what it looks like. It looks like you rocking up to Wimbledon with one of these and going, all right, Novak, let's go. That's Djokovic if you didn't know. You know? All right, Federer, I'm ready. I'm ready, let's go. And this is what you look like. You rocking up with your money and, and with your cosmopolitan, you know, and the 10 things I hate about you and that's why my relationship failed and from that magazine, you know, and now you try to implement it. You look like you're turning up to Wimbledon with a, this plastic tennis racket and God is saying, pick up my word of God which is like the best tennis racket ever and gives you a power shot every time you swing it. Amen. And you're going into a, a battle with weapons of the world trying to beat spiritual weapons, trying to beat spiritual battles from the enemy. It's insane. Did you ever think rest was a weapon? Did you ever think, did you ever think opening up your Bible and reading is a weapon? That is a weapon. Did you ever think prayer was a weapon? Prayer is a weapon, people. Prayer is a weapon. You have been given everything that you need to let Jesus advance the kingdom through you. And let's, be, let's, just, be, let's just be clear. The battle is over. The battle has already been won. The victory is yours. And so when you fight these battles, like trying to, Satan trying to stop you from getting to church, you need to operate out of a place of victory and tell that to the enemy. Amen. I'm making a church because I come from a place of victory. And I plead the blood of Jesus that was poured out on the cross for my forgiveness all over this situation. Because I declare victory in this place. Amen. And I declare victory in this church and all over this region. Amen. I know revival's coming because I know who my Savior is. Amen. Amen. And we fight from a place of victory, of victory. Do not turn back. Armed with a bow, they turn back. Do not turn back. Advance the kingdom. Kingdom first. Seek first the kingdom. What do you need to, sit to, to advance the kingdom? What weapons do you need? What faith do you need? What miracles do you need? The kingdom comes first. It will be added to you. Don't go seeking the miracle. God will give you the miracle. He will add it to you. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom and it will be added to you. God gives us what we need as long as we seek first the kingdom. Amen. Some of us are seeking miracles for the sake of a miracle. Seek first the kingdom. Amen. Do not turn back. 
And here's the kicker. They had bows. Do you know what a bow is? The enemy wasn't even going to get close to them because they had bows. Don't go seeking out the enemy. Let God do that. God's already won the victory. Walk in freedom. Walk in life. Walk in victory. Amen. It goes on and says, yet they kept sinning. All the more against them, rebelling against the God most high. They tested God in their hearts, demanding the food they craved. Demanding. And they said, can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck a rock so that water gushed out. Can he even also give bread? Tested him in their hearts. God gave them manna. They wanted meat. And we wonder why the prosperity gospel is so dangerous. They, they had manna and they wanted meat. And they're, and they're grumbling, saying, can't God even spread a table for me in the wilderness? Where's all the extra stuff I want? God provides what we need, not what our flesh desires. Not what our flesh craves. You know, in the story, God actually gave them quails, right? They gave them what their flesh does. Okay, if manna's not enough, I'll give you some quails. And then he, and then he, and then he like poured judgment on them all. Some of us, we need our planes to crash because we've forgotten who's got us there. We're dissatisfied with what we've got, right? And the reason that they were dissatisfied is because they believed God couldn't do it. They believed, their unbelief went so far to say, this man is not enough, give me steak. You know, this little bit's enough, give me more. And then they said, it's just because you can't. If you're the God Almighty that you think you are, come on then. And so God said, okay, here's some quails. And, you know, it, it upset God. It upset God. It upset God. And the same, the same language is used in the psalm where it says, God prepares a table for you in front of your enemies. God prepares exactly what you need, right? With the enemy prowling around. And we're saying, I want more. You know, it's funny because like we, I love steak so much. It's an idol. Sorry, Lord. And sometimes my wife tries to live biblically and look after the budget and buy steak from Audi. And it's rubbish. And it's really small. And sometimes I go to the cheeky butcher and the steaks are really big. And I find myself grumbling every time I eat an Audi steak. Like, the cheeky butcher ones are so good. They're so big, you know, that I forget to even be thankful I'm eating meat. <laughs> Amen. And I feel like that's our, that's our walk with God. We're sitting there eating the little steak. Oh, where's the big steak, Lord? Where's the big steak? That we've forgotten what God's done for us. <laughs> Amen. Right? Is God your provider? We're going to finish soon. If you've got lunch plans, it's okay. Is God your provider? I just want to say this story really quickly. There's this guy. This is amazing, right? It's a book called God Can, right? And it's by J. Edwin Orr, right? And this guy was in 1934, in the middle of the Depression, right? God told him, I'm going to use you to go start a revival. And he said, we're, Lord, we're in a depression. I have no money, you know? And he's like, I don't care. And he got on his bicycle. He didn't have a car. He got on his bicycle and he rode around England and set up 300 prayer groups right, for the sole purpose of revival. And he said, God, if this is what you want me to do, then you will provide. And God provided houses for him to stay in, places to, to eat, provided absolutely everything in the middle of a depression, and he ended up setting th up 300 prayer groups all across England. So my question to you is, God, can God provide? Can God provide? Yes. Yes, he can. Amen. Amen. Yes, he can. The, and, and this is our last bit. Psalm 78, 24. This is what he rained down on them in the, in the, in the desert, in the wilderness. I've been, I've been told, oh yeah, man, it could have been like this man-made man stuff and it could have been this bread stuff. Okay, but the Bible tells me he gave them the grain of heaven. Amen. And he gave them the food of the angels. And that doesn't look like anything man-made to me. That looks like the grain of heaven. And he can do that at any point in time for you.
Is God your provider? There is more peace in the suffering of our flesh for our Lord than the gratifying of our flesh for our sin. Oh, there's some meat in the sermon today. There is more peace in the suffering of our flesh for our Lord than the gratifying of our flesh for our sin. Where is the manna in your life? Where has God provided just enough? Where has God provided just enough that you can be grateful for, that you can be thankful for? Is he trying to get you to the Garden of Gethsemane? Is he trying to get you to your knees? Is he trying to get a relationship with you? Five quick points. Know in your heart that he is faithful. You have two reasons for existing, to know God and to advance his kingdom. Give over every action to the advancement of God's kingdom. Every action. Every action. I go to my mundane job, Lord, advance your kingdom. Lord, I'm going to this baby shower, advance your kingdom. Father God, I'm going to church. May I speak to someone that doesn't know you and may they see the light in me and may you advance your kingdom. Lord, when I go to this prayer group, I pray that someone is there that needs a miracle and you advance your kingdom. Lord, every action in my waking and my sleeping and every breath I take, I pray to advance your kingdom. Four, lean into how God is shaping you. Sometimes it's not the enemy. Sometimes God is just shaping you. Pick up your spiritual weapons, but fight from victory. There, there is a time in the Bible, right, standing before the Pharisees, and Stephen, right, was asked a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Are these things so? Are the things that we've spoken about this morning, are they so? It means are they real? Stephen, put the kingdom first, reacted to this, this question with an amazing sermon, right? With a huge sermon to these Jews that wanted to kill him. It wasn't even an evangelist thing. It was to the Jews. It was the truth that came pouring out from his heart. And they were angry. And they're like, we're going to stone you. And God saw in that moment, before his death, what he needed. And he says, but he, that's Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What did Stephen need? To see where he was going before he was about to endure the stoning. And God showed him exactly what where he was going. He goes on to say, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. This young man named Saul, this Saul would go on after this happened and rampage the villages, rampage the towns. He would go into homes and he would drag out the Christians and he would chuck them into jail. Right? And he would order the execution of Christian after Christian after Christian. And Saul got in his head, there are Christians in Damascus. I must go to Damascus. I must go and kill the Christians in Damascus. And on the way to Damascus, he met Jesus Christ. Amen. And he met Jesus Christ and Jesus took away his sight and Jesus changed his name from Saul to Paul and Paul went on to write a third of the Bible and Stephen's death was a catalyst for Saul's conversion. Amen. And Paul went on to set up every church. He wrote half the New Testament through Stephen's death was the catalyst for one of the greatest evangelists in history. And maybe, maybe you need to see where you are going. Maybe you need to know that you have been saved from death and seated in heaven. Saved from death and seated in heaven. Is that enough? Is that enough to put all your trust in that who is faithful? Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Not what you want, but what you need for God's glory. Father God, we thank you for your word.
we thank you that you are a good God. Lord, we, we, just, we just... Oh. Amen. Father, if, if you... Sorry, the Holy Spirit just said, no, nah, stop, don't, let, don't give them an ounce. Don't give them an ounce. Do not give them an ounce. Because I said at the start of this sermon, right, that God wants a response. Amen. Like we actually have to respond. And so if you have built your life on the, on the foundation of sand, if you've you built your life on something else other than God in any situation in your life, and you say, today is the day that I build my life on a firm foundation, Lord, take my mess, take my bucket of crap, take whatever I have, Lord, even reveal to me things that I do not know, Lord, and help me to rebuild on the firm foundation of you. Help me to seek First, the kingdom. If that is your prayer, just stand up and I'm going to pray over you. So if that is your prayer, if you want to seek first the kingdom of God on this firm foundation, then just stand up and we're going to seek first the kingdom. We're going to bring revival to us. God will bring revival to us. Amen. Because we will be on a battleship together, forwarding and searching for God. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that you take our messes and you turn them into miracles, Father God. And Lord, I just thank you for, for the hearts in this room. Father, I thank you for those that have, that have recognised, that have been convicted by your Holy Spirit, that have had the courage, that have had the boldness to say, Lord, not my way, but your way. Not my world, but your kingdom, Father God. And may you advance your kingdom, Father. So, Lord, we just declare right now that... This, this will not be a moment in time, Lord, that means nothing, but this will be a moment in history, Father, that we'll look back on and say we made a decision today to further your kingdom for your glory. So, Father God, help us, Father, to build our life on a firm foundation, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship him. Our fight is with weapons unseen Enemies crash to their knees As we rise up in worship When trials unleash like a flood The battle belongs to our God as we cry out in worship The victory is yours You're riding on the storm Your name is unfailing The kingdoms rise and fall Your throne withstands it all your name is unshaken. What hell meant to break me has heard. Now nothing will silence my praise. We love and worship. These walls of the prison will share The chain breaking King Christ to save As we cry out in worship The victory is yours You're riding on the storm Your name is unfair And fall, your throne withstands it all. Your name is unshaken, the victory is yours. You're riding on the storm, your name is unfailing. The kingdoms rise and fall, your throne withstands it all. Your name is unshaken. You roll like thunder. 
Nothing can tame a God all powerful, all powerful. You pull down heaven with shouts of praise, a God all powerful, all powerful. You roar like thunder. Nothing can tame a God all Your name is unshaken. 